Hello and welcome to the Good Mood Podcast. I'm Dr. Tally Marcajani. I'm a naturopathic doctor and this is a podcast where we talk all things natural medicine, functional medicine, and your hormones and mood. And we've covered topics like digestion, your neurotransmitters, your hormones, different mindset topics. Um, And so please, if you can, after this episode, if you enjoy it, follow us and like us or leave a comment on Apple Podcasts or at least subscribe on your favorite podcast platform wherever you're listening. That would be amazing. So I was walking one day and just thinking about nutrition. I was just sort of meditating on the idea of nutrition and how I've come to form my understanding of how nutrition works. I've talked about this before, um, but nutrition is a very complicated topic and it's a different, it's different than other sciences. And as a naturopathic doctor, I am constantly talking about and thinking about nutrition. And our, our beliefs come, so our beliefs in general come from external factors, right? Our research, other people's stories, things we've read, things we see, advice we've been given, and also internal factors, personal observation of our own experiences. And my beliefs about food and nutrition have formed through reading scientific studies, nutritional studies, my education. uh, I have an undergraduate degree uh, in life sciences and my education as an MD, as a naturopathic doctor, the books I've read, the, the topics that have interested me, the podcasts I've listened to, the lectures I've attended, and this understanding of biochemistry combined with anthropological data and anthropological studies, and then my own embodied experiences and my clinical experiences. And these beliefs, just like the beliefs of any doctor will inform the way that they practice. These beliefs form the way I practice and they form biases in the way that I even do further research and interpret that research or even understand patient experiences or my own experiences with food. These beliefs inform the way I put together my foundational program, how I talk about nutrition with patients and how I talk about food on Instagram, on YouTube, on this podcast, how I interact with my podcast guests and how I'm talking to you today. So I thought it'd be interesting to write them down and to talk about them with you and just explicitly examine them and perhaps start a conversation on food because it's such a controversial topic. It's almost like discussing politics or religion when we actually sit down and talk about how we eat, what we believe we should be eating, what we we believe we shouldn't be eating. And there's this concept of mental models. Like it's interesting to consider your mental models that have influenced how you see nutrition. I decided today to write down some of the mental models. What's my journey been like when it comes to food? What was the timeline like for me as I started to think about food? Because we humans are really interesting. You know, a squirrel doesn't really think about what they, what he or she eats. A squirrel just sort of gets food and has this intuitive embodied, I imagine, I'm obviously projecting and speculating on what a squirrel's experience is, but a squirrel just has this intuitive, natural sense about what to eat and what not to eat. And a squirrel, you know, doesn't go on a diet. A squirrel doesn't do fasting or keto. A squirrel just follows the rhythms of nature. It's really only humans that have such a complex relationship with food and how we eat and all of the factors that influence our diets and our understandings of how we should be eating. So for me, you know, when I was a kid, I actually struggled with weight gain. I have a family history of diabetes. So on my mom's side, we're a combination of Belgian and Canadian, Scottish. On the other side of my family, I'm Italian. 
And on my mom's side, there is a history of diabetes, weight gain, sort of lymphatic conditions. And so as a kid, you know, I tend to, I was born pink, I was born a big baby, and I really liked to eat. And I remember always having a sugary snack in my lunch. I remember not really being much of a picky eater, being a pretty good eater. I would have sugary cereal for breakfast. And I remember just sort of binge eating, like going downstairs and sneaking snacks was supposed to be for my lunch and just eating them and hiding the wrappers. And we did have a, a good sense of nutrition in my household. Um, my mom was nutritionally minded. We followed sort of a heart and stroke foundation, understanding of food, like low fat, high fiber. My mom would cook home cooked meals and the treats were really there as a, like a moderation thing. Like I would get a snack in my lunch if I ate my sandwich. I remember eating whole grain bread, brown bread. I remember, um, homemade bread. I remember soups and and liking vegetables like broccoli. But I I really had a sweet tooth, and I and I you know like many kids have this internal modulating system that gets suppressed as we move into adulthood and go through an experience of dieting. And so kids, you know, if you feed them ice cream, they, they, a kid might say something like, "Oh, I really want ice cream," and then they'll kind of get halfway through and not be able to finish it. And this is something that a lot of adults who have had an experience with dieting or food restriction, which is most of us, sort of look at that and really envy it. Like, my gosh, he just put it away and stopped eating it. And I don't really remember being like that. <laughs> I remember always being able to finish it and being jealous of my brother who was slower and had some stuff left. When I was about 13 years old, so my mom had lost weight. She'd gone on Weight Watchers and she'd lost some weight. And I remember this badge on the fridge that I guess you got when you were a member of Weight Watchers and it was like, I've lost 10 pounds. And we would laugh at that and joke, but I remember feeling a little bit of, hmm, you can lose weight. You don't have to be overweight because at that point I was in middle school and I was kind of suffering being chubby. Kids would call me fat and make fun of me. And it wasn't a good feeling. I was an active kid. I played soccer. I swam. I played baseball. I, I was interested in going for bike rides and being active. And I had a very active imagination. I'd play outside with my friends. So that wasn't the problem, but I was chubby. I always remember being weight conscious. Even when I was young, I have a diary entry from when I was eight years old that starts off with, that's it. From now on, I'm going on a diet. From now on, I'm only eating sandwiches. And that's eight years old, grade three. So there was already this internal sense of body shame and body image issues and not being happy with how I looked and my weight. When I was in high school, I think like around age 13, 14, I decided to do Weight Watchers as well. I didn't join it officially, but I followed the program essentially at that time. I don't know how the program is now exactly, but at that time it was about essentially counting calories, but foods were awarded uh, points, which reflected the calorie content and was influenced by their fat content and their fiber content. So if a food was high in fat, it would have more points. Um, and if a food was high in fiber, it would have less points. So I was essentially eating quite low calorie, lost weight, but I was also going through puberty. And many uh, females will sort of lose some baby fat as they move through puberty, as they're, you know, as they start to get their period. And it could have been that as well. But I was also eating a lower calorie diet. And I remember feeling really great when I started. I was making these sort of whole grain rye sandwiches with mustard. I wasn't eating fries and chicken fingers from the school cafeteria. And I remember feeling more energy, feeling lighter and feeling what I would have described at the time as healthy. And it was really encouraging. It was sort of the first glimpse into this idea that how you eat can profoundly influence how you feel. But I wasn't eating enough as I look back. I didn't know it at the time. I actually thought I was failing to stay within my point allotment. But as you know, a, 
I was going through my teenage years and I was doing this from essentially, you know, age 13 to 18 all throughout high school. And I was binge eating. Um, there would be these moments where I would lapse into just eating everything I could. I remember just shoving peanut butter and ice cream together with one spoon into my mouth as I stood at the kitchen sink, um, you know, eating to the point of sickness. And I thought there was something wrong with me. I remember Googling binge eating disorder and sort of self-diagnosing myself with that. But looking back, I was under eating. I was active, I was working out and I was eating probably something like a thousand calories a day or whatever it was. But I sort of stayed on this throughout university, this low cal, low fat idea, really tracking calories. And when I was in university, I started exercising pretty intensely, endurance exercise. I was going to the gym for an hour or two a day. And I thought that was great. I didn't really understand. And, you know, my weight did stall. I weighed essentially the same then as I do now. And it's interesting that throughout this journey, there hasn't been much of a major fluctuation in my weight. Um, but at that time, I remember being exhausted. I remember having almost like a tunnel vision where I'd feel lightheaded and really just like, you know, starving and, and weak. And, um, and I was doing the partying that you do at university as well. Then I decided that I, I was gonna go vegetarian. So I was doing some more reading and it just seemed like the right thing to do. I didn't really like meat anyways. And I thought that that would be better for health. I was still sort of trying to understand nutrition and health and really following a lot of the sort of Canada's food guide recommendations. Lots of whole grains, low fat, dairy, lots of dairy, dairy at every meal and calories, you know, like eat less, exercise more, um, which we call the SICO method, calories in, calories out. I was really following that. Eventually I became vegan. And at this point I was living in Colombia. And let me tell you that Colombia is not the best place to be vegetarian or vegan, but I was really making an effort. I was eating a lot of the, um, the textured vegetable protein. <laughs> I was, um, eating some eggs here and there and maybe some fish, but really trying to be um, vegan and vegetarian. And when I got back to Canada in 2010 and started studying to be a naturopathic doctor, I had a bunch of nutrient deficiencies. I had gained a bunch of weight as a vegetarian or vegan, and I was um, really just not feeling good. I was really tired. I was sort of experiencing this puffiness, just lethargy, tons of food cravings, but never really meat cravings until I walked past a Korean restaurant near where I was living and it, and it smelled really good. And my doctor told me that my iron was low. And at that moment, I just decided I'm going to eat meat again. When I was studying to be a naturopathic doctor, I was living for a, a couple of years with my Italian grandmother. And my lunch would be a big Tupperware bucket of leftover pasta with sauce. Um, so sort of cereal in the morning, maybe more healthy cereal, pasta, soup, and, and things like that, lots of wheat. And as I was studying, I was being exposed to this idea of gluten and food sensitivities. And the idea started to percolate, but was met with a ton of resistance because I mean, how was I gonna cut out wheat when I was living with my Italian grandmother and my lunch was literally a bucket of pasta. So I really resisted the idea that gluten was an issue. And even maybe that food was an issue to the extent that it was exposed um, in my studies, in my lessons. And, but I was also getting weekly migraines. So I would spend most Saturdays on the couch, completely out of commission, in intense pain, vomiting, not able to look at anything or listen to anything with sort of a, a towel over my face. It was really bad. And eventually I did go, oh, I, I, so what, what sort of changed everything was I was at a lecture, sort of a free lunch and learn, and I was given a detox kit and it was just a couple of shakes that you added to water. 
So it basically was this elimination diet where you replaced a couple meals with shakes. And I use that to, to spur me on this seven day cleanse type thing, which event, which ultimately involved removing gluten, dairy, sugar, caffeine. And I felt horrible during that week. It was awful. But by the end of that week, I was off gluten and I was off dairy. And so I continued that on and I continued this idea of like an elimination diet where I was eating more fruits and vegetables, whole gluten-free whole grains um, and you know meats and things like avocado, olive. So more anti-inflammatory, then moved more to a paleo type diet. Then I experimented with the ketogenic diet for about a year and I have a blog post on that, my experience with it. Then I started doing more fasting each attempting to do a 48 hour fast. And there were some benefits to that, just like there were with keto. But after a certain period of time, the, my periods stopped, I was losing hair. Um, initially, these practices helped with this metabolic flexibility where I felt like I could go longer periods of time without getting these blood sugar crashes. I used to get anxious if I was away from food for more than two hours and I would definitely get hangry. And the being keto and, 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 and doing intermittent fasting really helped heal that. I noticed a lot of anti-inflammatory effects where I wouldn't get sort of puffiness and I would have a lot of enter energy and a lot of mental clarity and it was some of my most productive times was doing keto and doing this intermittent fasting but after a certain period of time it started to backfire and I started to yeah stop having a period get hair loss I didn't experience any more weight loss and I didn't experience much weight loss at all throughout this time um, throughout any of these diets I might have lost some initially and then it would just kind of level out and plateau the only time I really experienced more significant weight loss was when I did um, fasting. And then it was, then I would sort of force it down, but I would go to the grocery store and I would walk by the frozen food, the microwave ready meals and just sort of salivate and fantasize. I'd open up my Uber Eats app and just look at dishes. And I was obsessed with food because I wasn't getting any. There would be these moments of binging. And I came to realize in that moment that for me at least, and for probably most of the people I work with when I analyze their situation, binge eating or emotional eating is really a result of deprivation and restriction and not necessarily an emotional issue unless proven otherwise, unless proven so. Then let's fast forward to more recently. I um, did some more exploration to my microbiome to heal the gut and did a Viome test and got some revelation from that. I know that test is controversial scientifically, but I found it was useful. I found it was a useful building block and stepping stone. I've done other gut tests, like other stool tests and food sensitivity testing and just different things as I, I experimented in my attempt to walk the talk that I you know, practice what I preach with my patients. And now, and then I started looking into something called reverse dieting. So there are people like Stephanie Buttermore or Kayla Itzness, a man called Matt Stone, that talk about metabolic refeeding. This idea that going through periods of restriction and starvation can actually slow our metabolism, causing a lot of our health issues. And that it's through refeeding some therapeutic weight gain and really stoking our metabolism through eating more calories. So the opposite of eat, eat less, exercise more, resting the body, resting the metabolism can have beneficial effects. And I really started to just let my body do what it needed to do. I did experience some weight gain and then things leveled off as my appetite did. And now I wouldn't say I practice intuitive eating, but a, a sort of educated and intentional way that I choose foods, foods that I know sort of work for my body. Because as I've been observing the effects of different foods on my body, I can kind of understand what foods are good for me and work for me and what foods don't, which is something I encourage my patients to do. Um, it takes a lot of time though. It's a, it's a long process to do so. 
And I, and I also eat to appetite and really notice my cravings, my hunger and my energy levels and let those be the, the guiding source of how I make food decisions. And I'm sure this process will evolve, um, but that's where I'm at today. And so what, I, I, you know, I, I encourage you, like, what, what are your mental models? You know, like I have all of these different mental models in my head and, you know, so the whole foods, anti-inflammatory diet, the Ayurvedic six tastes and how there should be a sample of all six tastes or the traditional Chinese medicine five tastes, <laughs> which sounds more confusing than maybe it is, you know, macronutrients and micronutrients and foods that are good for the microbiome and making sure that there is a, that, that foods are nutrient dense and low in chemicals and not very processed. So I still have all these mental models that guide um, my food behaviors and my dietary patterns. And I believe that food contributes to our health and I believe that food contributes to disease. But I don't believe that food is the only factor in contributing to these things. And I think this is sometimes difficult because a lot of us are, I feel a lot of shame around food. Maybe it's because we believe that, you know, we, we have been told that it's really dieting that will shift your body shape. And a lot of us feel shame around our bodies in general, but most of that shame is directed to our shape. But I definitely am aware that talking about food, it can be quite shame inducing and can be quite triggering. And I hope, you know, if you feel triggered during this episode, that, I, you know, I just want to give you permission to, to, to pause the episode, to go for a walk and to let go of this conversation if you feel that that's right for you. But I think, so I think food plays much more of a role in our health than conventional medicine would claim. Um, doctors have told my friends and patients with IBS, for example, irritable bowel syndrome, that yes, nutrition is good for your health and it's important to be healthy, to you know, have a better outcome with this condition, but it, food does not do anything for this condition. That's a very common thing I've heard for various health conditions. But at the same time, I also believe that food is less of a direct factor in our health than many of, you know, the Instagram influencers or nutritional salespeople would assert. And you know, the ones I'm talking about, the one who write books like The Cure for X Disease and things like that. Like you can cure your cancer with carrot juice or whatever. I really don't think it's as simple as that. I don't think that if you're sick or you know someone who's sick, that they got there because of their food. And this is a, is a mistake I think that can happen in the natural community where, you know, if someone has cancer or autoimmune condition, we, we want to figure out what they did wrong. It's partly fear-based thinking because we want to separate ourselves in some way from someone's situ a situation that we don't want to happen to us, but it's not that simple. Um, so for example, you know, you ate carrot cake, it didn't cause your diabetes. Gluten isn't the cause of your depression. It, in very, very, very rare cases, if you have severe like celiac, maybe that's contributing to your mood, but it's most likely not in most cases. Um, yeah, there can be profound effects for some people when you take gluten out. And it's kind of like a lot of things, like sometimes there can be profound effects when you recommend magnesium to somebody. But most often it's, it's about our dietary patterns. How do we eat and behave over time that influences the way we feel and the health of our bodies? I believe that food plays a key role in shaping us. It shapes our physical and emotional and mental bodies. And obviously, I mean, food contains the nutrients we need to function. That's really important. When we talk about food, we're all, almost always talking about restriction, taking things away, take this away, you know, um, remove this, reduce this. But, would, but now when I work with my patients, I really am talking about additive food recommendations. So what 
can, what can we do to make sure that someone is feeding their cells with the nutrients that they need to work, feeding their microbiome, feeding their body, like putting gasoline in a car, fueling. Food is also one of the important ways that our bodies receive input from the outside environment. And we, this information is communicated through the nutrients that our body gets. It can tell us everything from what time of day it is to whether it's hot or dry or whether there's enough food or whether we're living in stressful times. So for example, resveratrol is a plant compound found in red grapes, so found in wine. And um, it tells our cells that the, and it grows in grapes that are in hot and dry conditions and it, it boosts our body's ability to respond to hot and dry conditions. It's sort of this communication, it's like a warning signal from the plant to our body. I also, you know, believe that that we can be consuming toxins that might not be good for us, pesticides and, and different chemicals from our environment. And I believe that through food we can heal. So through food choices over time, we can heal our nutrient deficiencies. Um, and I also believe that if we try and survive off too many things that aren't really food, ultimately developing nutrient deficiencies or putting a burden on our body of things that need to be cleared or removed, then disease can start to form. And we can simplify this by thinking about our pets. You know, you can feed your, when, when you feed your dog really good food for dogs, you know, good meat and eggs and maybe even some whole grains and root vegetables and green vegetables and liver and organ meats, your dog is really healthy. And, you know, if you're not, you know, dogs that aren't eating well, maybe corn-based products or something like that, um, just not going to be as healthy, maybe. So food is a way that we can connect to the earth. It's a lifestyle practice that can greatly influence how we feel. And it's really hard, though, to figure out what dietary patterns are healthy and are health promoting. And I think we have to sometimes take a more broad bird's eye view than analyze food and nutrition for each individual component. Yes, I believe we need all the nutrients that our bodies need to work, but whether we should be vegan or eat animals or you know, eat X food or Y food or tubers or grains or whatever, whatever the nutrient or food of contention of the day is, I think it's, we can't really look at it like that. A good example is the blue zones. So these are areas of the world where there's a higher percentage of centenarians or super centenarians. So people who live to be 100 or 110 years old. An example of this is Loma Linda, California, where the Seventh Day Adventists live, um, or Sardinia in Italy, or, or the um, Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. In Loma Linda, they are largely vegetarian, the Seventh Day Adventists but they also walk everywhere. They have a really tight community. And so it's impossible to say that the reason that people in Melinda are living so long is, their, is solely because of their diet. And it's also impossible to say that it's because their diet doesn't contain meat. Because one of the things they do in Loma Linda is grow their own food, eat locally, you know, they're eating organically, they're making sure that their soil is nutrient rich. And you have to contrast it with a place like Iceland, who for some reason didn't make it into the book about the blue zones, but also has a very high percentage of centenarians and super centenarians. And in Iceland, they're consuming sheep, sheep's liver, lots of meat, fatty fish. And so, you know, we can look at commonalities amongst these populations, but we're never going to really understand what specifically it is. And most food research is done through something called epidemiological studies. An epidemiological study looks at a group of people over time to see who gets sick or what happens to them health-wise and often checks in with them every few months or weeks or whatever it is and asks them what they eat. Now, 
these are called food frequency questionnaires. They're usually used to ask you something like, how often do you eat chicken? And these are, you can imagine, highly inaccurate. It's it, like, if somebody asked me how often I eat chicken, I would be sort of pulling a number out of my bum. <laughs> I wouldn't, I don't know, three times a week, seven times a week. It's really hard. And I, I talk to patients about their food all the time. And what someone tells me on a first visit in a 24 hour diet recall is vastly different from their diet diary that they hand in to me when we see each other for the second visit. So even just saying what you eat and then recording it over time are two vastly different things, let alone a food frequency questionnaire where you're asked to give a broad approximation of what you eat. And you know, our food choices are not made in isolation. We also make food choices based on our various factors. So red meat eaters who have been told that red meat is bad for years and years might tend to smoke or not exercise. They might have the what the, uh, what the hell mentality when they're eating red meat versus the sort of paleo person who's eating steak and broccoli and salad and doing CrossFit and getting lots of vitamin D from the sun or whatever. So, you know, the gold standard of research is to take one, one intervention and, and measure it against one outcome. So giving a group of people red meat and then taking the, a, a, an exactly similar group of people and giving them the exact same diet that doesn't have red meat and looking at, if, is there a difference in their health outcomes? And you can't really do that with food because we have to, because no matter what you do, you're, you're making a change in the opposite, in the, in, the, in the control group. It's not like a drug where you can give one person or one group the drug and one group a placebo, but, but that placebo group still gets a pill. With nutrition, people know what they're eating. So it doesn't have a, it's not really a blinded trial. And then the group that's not eating red meat, what are they eating instead? That thing instead, even if it's nothing, is still something. Are they eating more fruits and vegetables? Are they eating chickpeas instead of beef? Or are they just not eating, which means that they're doing lower calorie than the beef group? And that's gonna have an effect. So it's really impossible to measure nutrition in the way that we measure other things in medicine. And therefore it's really hard to draw conclusions from studies that we see in nutrition. With epidemiological studies as well, you have to look at effect size. So someone passed me an article that said that going gluten-free increases your risk of diabetes by 15%. Well, studies that told us that smoking was bad, they're also epidemiological studies because it's not ethical to give one group uh, you know, the instructions to smoke and another group the instructions not to. It's not ethical because you, know, you might kill the group that you tell to smoke. But the, the, the effect size that, con that connected smoking to cancer was like 3000%. So an increase in 15% risk of diabetes if you go gluten-free is almost just noise. It's, it's really not telling us anything because you could run the same study and find a reduction of 30%. You need to see a big effect size to even consider the data relevant. You also don't know the cause and effect. You have to, you know, you have to, um, you can't use correlation, which is what all epidemiological studies are looking at. Correlation is not causation. Like for example, there's a correlation between how many TV sets you own in Sweden and how high your taxes are. And that kind of makes sense, I guess. It means you have more money. There's a connection between smoking or um, eating ice cream and drowning. Why? Both of those things happen usually more frequently in the summer. So you can't, you can't say though that ice cream causes you to drown or that owning a TV set means you pay more taxes. They're connected by some other variable. And therefore the people that you know, ate more red meat and had a high risk of colon cancer, which is often pointed out, uh, are probably doing something else that is contributing to the colon cancer or maybe a few other things. Therefore, it's really hard to look at those kind of studies and decide what to do and how to eat. We have to zoom out a little bit and we have to look at populations, how they live, 
what they're eating. We have to look at exceptions. So if meat is horrible, then every single population that survives off of meat should be really sick. And it's obviously not the case. So we have to take a, a bird's eye view, a general view um, when it comes to food. I believe that our bodies are intelligent. I believe that our bodies have evolved mechanisms that can communicate to us what they need if we know how to listen to them. And this is the key point. So we have taste receptors that actually tell us about the quality of the food we're consuming. Freshly picked in season fruits and vegetables, if you've tasted them, taste very different than out of season ones. The richness of flavor corresponds to the richness of the nutrients present in the food we eat. So a, a fresh strawberry is super flavorful and it contains far more nutrients than those dull colorless, like, you know, strawberries that are transported on a truck from some other land and ripened by some chemical. And so we crave animal fat, we crave sugar, we crave salt. And we crave these things because they actually represent a density of nutrients that our body needs. We're drawn to colors in foods because colorful foods represented foods that were ripe and fresh and packed with nutrition. And so it's, I really like looking at things in medicine through the lens of evolutionary biology. And a lot of people in the field do. I trust that my body was formed as a response to an environment that's ever changing. And the fact that I'm alive or that you're alive is the result of billions of, well, let's say tens of thousands of generations of humans that made it this far and were able to pass on their genes. So you really are a miracle. You really are, you know, a success story. And so you gotta understand what your ancestors were like and, and think, you know, back to their point of view. And there's limitations to doing this, but it's always a fun thought exercise anyway. So the humans who were drawn to ripe nutrient dense fruit or the saltiness of animal protein or the delicious texture of fat would eat more of these foods. And eating more of these foods possibly gave them an evolutionary advantage, allowing them to survive and pass on their genes to future generations who also inherited preferences for these tastes. So consuming these foods is not bad. Consuming animal fat, consuming sweet foods like fruit and salty foods is not bad. Craving these foods is not bad. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or that you're weak or there's some moral issue. Sometimes we moralize our food choices and our cravings. Cravings and taste preferences represent a complex chemical system that evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to bring us to the things that helped us thrive. And I actually believe we should try to listen to our cravings, just like the way you sort of, with those old radios where you try and find the channel with the, with the dial, Let's try and, and really try and catch the signal that our body's trying to send us with our cravings because our cravings can be quite sophisticated. Talk to any woman who's been pregnant, any person that's been pregnant. But I also believe that big food has hijacked our taste buds. So there's a really great book called The Dorito Effect. And The Dorito Effect is where, high, where food companies hijack our natural drives, our cravings, and our taste preferences to get us to eat more of these like Franken foods. Um, like a Cheeto, for example, has been engineered to get you to crave it and to consume the whole bag and then to keep wanting more. So we, it really can take most of us who are living in North America, consuming the standard American diet and are exposed to these different food choices that have been you know, hijacking our food cravings and our taste buds um, to really question our cravings and to re-establish, re almost wipe the slate clean on trying to learn to, to let our bodies communicate with us. So if we're consuming a high amount of these sort of fake foods, foods grown in a lab, foods made in a plant, foods that have five or more ingredients that didn't exist in 1913 or all these different criteria that Michael Pollan suggests in his book, The Omnivore's Dilemma. Dilemma. I think we have to really question our, our cravings a little bit. Um, 
you know, how much of these foods is appropriate to eat? It's hard to say. And we, we're all starting from a different starting point. I personally try and minimize my consumption as much as possible, but I'm not perfect. And sometimes I, it's, it, you know, it's important to have an intentional treat. I'm not sure what the right answer is for you, but I do know that I can't let my body take the reins on what foods I might be needing. If I, if I am in a place where I'm consuming too many of these processed foods, um, so, you know, my body could be just chemically addicted to sugar. And so I, it's not really going to tell me if I need more carbohydrate or if I need more fructose. So I try and, and look for the, the sort of whole food version of the thing I'm craving, if I can. And, you know, and, and therefore just starting to develop this, this ongoing relationship between my taste receptors, the environment, my stomach, my mind, my cells. I'm trying to fine tune it and explore and learn from it. Sort of like, you know, a newborn baby and new parents and trying to like really understand what each cry means. One cry means a diaper needs changing. One cry means I need to cuddle. One cry means I'm hungry. How do we, how do we navigate these different cries? What are the different types of hunger that we experience in our bodies? When, what does it mean when we crave, you know, ice cream? Is it ice cream? Is it something else? I found that when I was craving uh, food after a meal, it meant I wasn't eating enough protein. So I believe that though, if I attempt to satisfy my body's craving, if I attempt to attune to these signals from my body, it's almost like I'm establishing a, a relationship with it. Just like a baby that knows their diaper will be fed, or will be will be fed, will be changed when they when they exhibit a certain kind of cry, no, they start to trust their environment. They start to trust their parents um, and they start to feel more tuned to and secure. And that's what I want my body to feel because by doing this, I believe I can reduce the stress response because we're all so chronically stressed. And by listening to my body and feeding it and caring for it when it needs to, I really believe I can, I can help my body feel safe. And I think this feeling of safety is what so many of our bodies need for us to not be living in this chronic state of anxiety and stress. A fairly controversial belief I have, perhaps, is that I believe that humans should consume a combination of plants and animals. And so on the one hand, I imagine that there's many animal rights activists, vegans, plant-based diet advocates who would tell me that you don't need animals to be healthy. And then on the other hand, there are people who are moving into the carnivore diet area of things where they are focusing most of their diet or all of their diet on animal foods and saying that, you know, cutting out all plants cure their autoimmune disease and that plants are actually toxic and contain toxic compounds that are good for the plant, but not necessarily good for you. You know what, maybe both people on either, on either extreme are right in some way there's, you know, we're all right in our own way. But I personally believe that humans evolved eating some sort of combination of animal and plant foods. I believe that we ate what was in our environment. And we really were highly motivated to eat animals. And eating animals really contributed to our evolution. But there are some societies that would consist of me on, on mostly plants. And I, you know, I think most cultures, hunter-gatherer cultures, or people in the blue zones are consuming a combination of plants and animals. And there are distinct nutrients that are very rare in plants and others that are rare in animals. Therefore, it's tough to get complete nutrition and focus on nutrient density if you're avoiding one, you know, it's sort of like we have two food groups, plants and animals. And if you're completely avoiding one, it's really hard to get certain nutrients, um, particularly from environments. Like if you take the example of Iceland, their landscape is largely covered with moss and the sheep that graze the landscape can turn the moss into something edible, which is sheep meat, but the humans can't consume the moss. Or like a cow eats grass and converts that grass into something that we can eat, nutrients that we can digest and absorb, which is cow milk and meat. And but we can't digest and consume grass in the way that a cow can. And so we're really using what we can from our environment. 
personally, I can't get enough protein on a plant-based diet and the forms of protein um, don't, well, don't work as well in my body. Um, but after eating too much meat and too many like sort of eggs, meat type thing, meat and potatoes, I really do start to crave salads and more whole grains like oats and, and beans. It's a very curious thing. Like I want lighter, lower fat, more vegetable foods. And I, I really feel that shift in my body when I move closer to one end of the spectrum or the other. High quality protein, iron, choline, vitamin D, EPA, and DHA, which are the marine omegas, zinc, tryptophan, which is amino acid that forms serotonin and melatonin, which are helpful for our mood and sleep. B12 and other nutrients are hard to get enough of in a plant-based diet while preserving the ratios. So, you know, the ratio of carbs to fats and protein is not necessarily a very specific number, but more of a broad idea of having enough in each bucket of macronutrients of carb, fat, and protein. Keeping the body's hormonal systems like blood sugar balanced and honoring our cravings. But I don't necessarily think that the paleo diet is the best diet. I don't think any diet is. I think the, the principle of paleo is a cool idea. I really like, like I said, focusing on our evolutionary roots and trying to understand what we consumed and what we did when we were um, really living in tighter connection to nature, just like a squirrel with their nuts <laughs> is tightly connected to their environment. I feel like we, we're so removed from our environment, from our food sources, that the more we can sort of think of where, you know, who were the people that were most closely connected to the land? How do we try and bridge that gap where we become closer to them and therefore closer to our bodies that are really the same bodies that they had? So I think the, the paleo principle is cool because we humans spent the majority of our time in a hunter-gatherer state before food processing and agriculture made things like grains and legumes digestible. And I think like we should try and feed our dogs like wolves and therefore we should try and eat like our primal ancestors because our, our bodies haven't evolved fast enough to keep up with you know high fructose corn syrup or these chemical ingredients that are meant to hijack our our. Um, cravings and our taste buds but don't but our bodies don't really know what to do with like I was reading somewhere that it would to get the amount of sugar from a can of coke you'd have to gnaw on eight feet of sugar cane which would also take up so much energy and and burn so many calories that it would you can't even do it so to swallow a can of coke in a few gulps is this crazy thing for our body it doesn't I don't think it really knows what to do with that so I really agree with that premise, but I also think that there's evidence that things like grains and legumes, to be more specific, to counteract the paleo argument, maybe were consumed before agriculture, but maybe just not in as high amounts. And our bodies are also different from the way they were when we were hunter-gatherers, because for example, we have more stress and therefore maybe it is helpful to eat a little bit more carbs than our hunter-gatherer ancestors may have consumed. So it's more complex than that. Another important point, I think, is that, so when you look at sort of paleo and carnivore, um, there's this sort of laissez-faire attitude towards animal fat, like tallow and lard. And I, and I believe that evolutionarily, that these things were probably beneficial for us because they came from animals that were, you know, grass fed, living in their natural environment. And many people that follow paleo and, and keto or carnivore will say, well, yeah, I'm eating grass-fed meat. So the fat I'm eating from that cow is, you know, is still good. It's still like what our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have consumed. But it's not because we've also um, artificially selected cows to be fattier. You know, so like wild game is much leaner than, than like, you know, even grass-fed cows. And the, the thing is that our environment now is so full of chemicals and animal fat is where chemicals are sequestered and therefore consuming, you know, lard and butter and tallow as the main fats in our diet might not actually be good for us anymore. 
And even if you're living in a remote environment, they, they've even found, um, you know, BPA in, in people who live in the Amazon and have nothing to do with our modern industrial chemical society. So I think we, we really need to appreciate our modern context and consume foods that are relatively unprocessed and well digested that weren't necessarily available when we were hunting and gathering our own food. And so to sum that point up, I think that the research points to the facts that like when we look at more of those epidemiological studies and dietary patterns, that there are very healthy populations currently living today that are consuming whole grains like oats and buckwheat and legumes like lentils. And therefore, you know, especially legumes, I think we have to conclude that, it, you know, it, they're either good for us or they're so they're so insignificantly bad for us that they don't have an impact on our health if we're if we're eating well. So let's say like somebody is eating legumes, but they're also doing all these other healthy things. And that's why the research shows that eating legumes is good for us. Well, in that case, it really doesn't matter then if you eat legumes. <laughs> but I think it's probably most likely that legumes have, they do confer a health benefit. So food is also social. We don't make nutrition decisions in a vacuum. We use food to communicate. We with food, we say, I love you. Thanks for lending me your Back to the Future DVD set. Sharing food is an important part of our biology of the human existence. Humans are social creatures and our socialness orients around food for a variety of reasons. Celebration, socialization, socialization of children, peacemaking, reward, pleasure, art, cultural cross-communication and cultural tolerance, et cetera, et cetera. And I eat differently depending on who I'm with. I eat more meat with cer certain people. I eat more plant-based with others. I eat more fruit when I'm visiting my friend in Costa Rica. I eat more snacks when I'm at my parents' house. Uh, you know, I when I'm with my ND buddies, I eat differently than when I'm with like muggles or other non-NDs. And navigating food in a social realm can be really difficult. It's sort of a balancing act between our own internal values around food and our values around connection. So for example, not offending someone. And an example of this is, you know, when uh, a friend was saying like, she was living in sort of a communal uh, intentional living environment and they would take turns cooking dinner and some people that she was living with would cook like this lovingly made chicken pot pie. And what do you do in that situation if you know you can't digest the gluten in it or whatever? And it, sometimes we need to make choices that balance those potentially conflicting um, values or, or conflicting needs that we have. So I've suffered when my food choices didn't fall into the realm of the society I was living. Like I used the example already of being vegan or vegetarian in South America and then living with my nonna while considering being gluten-free. <laughs> and really coming to terms with the fact that maybe the gluten was connected to my migraines. Um, so we have many conflicting values around food. And I, you know, on Instagram posted a picture of lunch I was making, which is like a big piece of steak with, you know, grilled peppers and potato. And someone might look at that and be like, oh my gosh, she's really letting herself go. And someone else is like, oh, she's super on point and really healthy. So it's interesting what we, when we see food that's shown to us, what are our perceptions around it? I believe that certain foods can contribute to inflammation. In my case, gluten and dairy don't sit well with me. And this has been something I've concluded over lots of trial and error, lots of quote, cheating <laughs> and lots of exploration. It's not something that I just concluded because you know somebody told me to feel bad about eating it. And that's not what I want you to conclude from this. I also believe that certain foods can help soothe my troubled emotions and overwhelm at times, and that that could be anti-inflammatory. It really is a balancing act. I was like super addicted to those heavenly hunk things from Costco. Those super comforting to have those. So to be honest, you know, I don't really like wearing socks and shoes. 
I just, you know, if, if given the choice, I go barefoot. I would rather prance around barefoot as the bonafide urban dwelling earth child that I know myself to be deep down. But I'm aware that we live in a world where the ground is sharp and in Canada, the ground is often really cold. <laughs> and so sometimes it's literally just not safe to walk around barefoot, but it's also in many cases not socially acceptable either. So I don't, because even though I love being barefoot, I can't always do it. It's not always appropriate. And the same thing goes with eating ice cream. Sometimes you're trying to avoid dairy, but other times it might be appropriate for you to have some. And everyone's on a sliding scale with that. I can truly tell you that I don't really crave dairy or refined sugar or gluten anymore. I don't really have a struggle internally with not eating pizza. Um, but many people, but, but again, this is something that's really formed over, over years and years and years of having pizza and feeling terrible. And so it really, if, if that's not happening to you, it's going to be really hard and probably not even healthy to moralize trying to avoid a food. And so sometimes it's appropriate to have some. Under certain circumstances, eating the ice cream or having the pizza might be the healthier choice. If you're recovering from restrictive eating or an eating disorder, then maybe it's the most healing, brave thing you can do is have a big slice or two of pizza. I think that food obsession and shame really don't belong in the health space. And it's tough because even when I'm trying to convince a patient that, you know, weight loss is maybe not the best goal, that, that I really wanna make sure their body's nourished and has the ingredients it needs to be healthy, that can be really hard to take in depending on where you're at. Eating well can bring us closer to health. However, steer the ship slowly. Be patient with yourself. Be curious about the process. Learn to pay attention to your body. Just, you know, if you want to do a cleanse, like somebody asked me this week, like, do you think doing a cleanse would be harmful? And I said, is a 27 day cleanse? And I said, I don't think it will be harmful. Um, but you can, you don't have to do it for 27 days. You don't have to not do it for 27 days, but if you feel terrible after three days and your body is screaming to you that, you know, it's wrong, you don't need to do it. Or maybe you do the cleanse for one meal and two meals and have pizza sometimes and maybe you don't do it perfectly. Maybe you learn something from the cleanse that was really useful and you just sort of do that thing. It's up to you, you know. I believe that embodiment is the key to bringing us back to nature and understanding our relationship with food again. And, you know, connecting to nature, connecting to our bodies, I think is the truth in all this. I think that a lot of these blue zones are so healthy because they're living so closely connected to their natural environment. They're eating what's available in their natural environment. They're connected to the earth. They're growing their food. They're eating food in its most foody, food-like form. Sometimes we need help with our relationship with food because like I said, we're so far removed from it. And sometimes we need to unwind the years of food shame and diet culture and these mental models to figure out what foods we even like, let alone what's good for us. So I sometimes tell patients, you know, I, I sometimes impose new mental models with my patients, for example, have some protein every time you eat would be one. And when I give these suggestions, I'm saying, just try it, just see what happens. Don't just take my word for it, like take out gluten because you think it's evil or eat the protein because you think it's good and impose another, another restrictive or you know, doctrinating or um, authoritarian principle on your body. Because sometimes a salty snack craving means that you need protein. Um, and that doesn't mean it's bad to satisfy that craving with popcorn. But if you do eat popcorn and then some protein, how do you feel? Is the craving gone? And sometimes cravings for carbs and salt is the body asking for more protein. Um, we actually eat to hit a protein threshold. 
So if someone's really upset by food cravings or craving on sugar, maybe it's that's a signal from our body that you need more protein. And maybe not. But so so try to have the protein. See what happens. And 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 therefore like allow a line of communication to form between your body and you. Just like when your baby cries and you you change the diaper and she's still crying. So you offer her food, she's still crying, she's not hungry. So you cuddle her and then she calms. It's this, it's, you're creating this line of communication. Now you know what that cry means. It's a process that involves trying things from a place of curiosity, not judgment, and paying attention to how you feel when you eat, when you don't eat with certain things you eat. If someone asks you for directions to a coffee shop, for example, in a language that you don't understand, and then you try and be helpful and you're like, oh, just go to this like bookstore. Cause you're like, oh, they'll, they'll love the bookstore. So like where, I don't know, it doesn't matter where they wanna go. Like it's beautiful there and it's a really wonderful place and they'll read all these great books. But that person's not happy because they actually wanted a coffee and a piece of pie. And so even though your intentions were pure, and you were just trying to help and listen, you, you, you just didn't speak their language. So I tell patients, have protein when you experience cravings and that might help you get enough protein. Or let's try taking out this food and just see what happens, but we're gonna put it back in. We're gonna put it back in because we have to put it back in to see if it provokes an inflammatory response. So we even know it was the food that did all the wonderful things that cause you to feel better. Um, and then we're gonna see, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're going to learn this new language. And so cravings or wanting foods, they're not bad. They're actually essential. They're a language. Feeling stuffed or too full isn't bad. That's another language. So is hunger, hunger, satiation, cravings, mind hunger, feeling stuffed to the gills, all these sensations in the body are important syntax in the language your body uses to talk to you, to tell you how to feed it. And it's really hard to listen when you're in a room full of shameful, criticizing voices screaming at you. So it can take a lot of time to learn how to listen and how to speak your body's language. But I believe that really is the key to nutrition. So I encourage you take, you know, tell me what you think of this episode. What are some of the mental models that influence your nutritional habits? What are your dietary patterns? Um, are, do you use food you know, or your control around food to, to tell you about the kind of person you are? Are you, are you creating these false equivalents where you're, you know, when you have a day of quote, eating good, <laughs> that you feel like you've done a good job for the day, that you're a good person for the day. I was in this place before. And there, I'm still in places some days where I feel like that. And it really can take, you know, we, we really are in this culture where, where we're rewarded for overworking and not sleeping and for surpassing our body's signals. And diet culture tells us that we should ignore our hunger. And, and you know, a lot of us are trying to overcome that or just consider a different way. So thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe to the podcast, listen to other episodes. If you could leave me a review on Apple, that would be amazing. And I have some other really great interviews lined up for you. I'm really excited about. So thank you so much for listening. This is the Good Mood Podcast and I'm Dr. Talia Marcajani, naturopathic doctor.